When I was young, I was um, drawing all the time, and I started painting in oils when I was four years old. I remember my grandmother gave me my first set of oil paints when I was very young, and I started started painting then. I remember doing mainly battle scenes and um, kind of gory stuff, actually, so I, I didn't start by doing very childish drawings, I don't think. So, I mean, I was obsessed by battles and by war at that young age. Um, I think I was quite difficult um, to be with at the t uh, when I was young. Um, I, did, I was quite um, shy. Um, I was determined I wanted to be an artist or um, a... In fact, I, <laughs> I wanted to be either an artist or a clown in a circus. Uh, <laughs> So that was, my, that, and then later on a gardener. I wanted to be a gardener, but anyway, the the art the art thing won out in the end, and I I don't think I've ever changed in my my um, ambition, if you want to call it that, to be an artist. Um, so when I was young, I was I was given extra tuition at um, at school by the art teacher they must have seen something in me. I was always kind of bringing things in to show them and drawings and paintings that I'd done and the art teacher took a special interest in me. Helen Lees was her name actually. She was probably one of the people that was instrumental, that were instrumental in, in uh, nurturing me when I was young. Um, and uh, I kind of lonely in a way, you know, lonely um, standing outside the school gates, just kind of on my own all the time, kind of bullied as well, um, bullied a lot, I remember that. Yeah, I think the, I think the first time, um, I mean, I hated going to school, actually, I hated it. Um, I remember my mother dragging me to nursery school when I was about three and a half, um, and they sent me home the first day because I was so wound up, I think, and I caused uh, commotions and chaos in the wherever I was. I remember, I just remember running about screaming. So I hated that. I think when I went to primary school, first of all, uh, we'd moved to Scotland at the time from London, and um, I was must have been about four and a half, five years old. Um, the uh, uh, I was, I just hated it. I was, um, the, the bullying didn't really start till about the fourth or the fifth year, um, in the primary four, primary five. Um, uh, but I used to get my, my lunch money taken off me and, you know, it even got to the stage where, uh, I got beaten up a few times, um. I never told my mum and dad about it. I never mentioned to them. I kept it in myself. But it kind of made me angry inside, I think, as well. Um, uh, so I get called all sorts of names. And it, it's probably had more effect on me than, I, than I'd ever, than I'd, um, I'd imagined it would have, you know, because I, I, um, it turned me into someone that, kind of wanted revenge on the bullies at one point. And I started, um, when I was about 13, I started, um, I think I started to try and prove myself as to be strong, you know, and that was a kind of, it's not really me, if you know what I mean, to be aggressive um, in that kind of violent way, but I started training and, build, and building my, my um, strength up and, you know, basically bodybuilding and starting to uh, change in a way and to stand up to the bullies, you know, so it's, but it wasn't really, it, it, it wasn't really till I left school that I started to, to really find my way um, properly. Yeah, I mean, I had several traumatic um, events in my childhood that really did, um, 
affect me, you know, and I, I, I knew I had something wrong with me, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, because when I was being brought up, anything like autism wasn't really known about. Um, so I knew I was kind of, you know, I knew there was weird things happening to me, and I was very, very sh shy and, and uh, embarrassed at social occasions, and I found it very difficult to to um, engage with any kind of um, social gathering of any kind. I was happy in certain people's presence, um, uh, but some, but other people I couldn't take at all if they were too loud. Or and I've always hated loud noises, you know. I mean, it wonders. I, mean, I wonder why I ever joined the army, for instance, or you know, because I hate the loud bangs and the idea of being in the army and firing a rifle was totally alien. I mean, why did I join the army? That's the thing I've always asked myself. I mean, it's the, probably the most stupid thing I've ever done in my life. Um, but in fact, it's one of many, but um, it just shows you what kind of asp what Asperger is all about or what autism is all about, um, is that you, you I'm very impulsive, you know, and I'm very easily led, you know. Maybe not so much now because I've kind of, now that I'm nearly 65, I'm, I've kind of calmed down a wee bit now. I don't, I, I don't have the same kind of mad impulses anymore, but I mean, one of the, one of the mad impulses I had when I was young was the idea of bodybuilding so I could take revenge on the people that bullied me. And, and in fact, some of the things you wish for come true because when I got a job as a bouncer in the nightclub, the bullies that bullied me when I was young came into the nightclub, and I, I, you know, I did take take up take revenge on them at one particular night, you know. But it, it's just crazy because it wasn't really me, you know. It didn't feel like it was me, you know. Whereas now I feel like I am myself now, you know. to art school, um, a, I was age 17, and again, I wasn't really prepared for art school um, the first year. I didn't do very well in the first year. In fact, I failed it, uh, because I think that the type of stuff I was doing then wasn't really acceptable at art school um, in the first year. I don't think the tutors really liked my work, um, and I didn't really... I felt a bit shocked about that because I thought I was doing well, but so I failed the first year and I had to do a repeat project over the summer holidays so that I could try and get back in again. So eventually I did this project of drawing um, stuff, um, you know, projects and I applied again and they got, they let me back in again. and. Uh, so I was able to do second year, but I hated second year as well because, you know, all the, all they got me to do was paint fruits and vegetables and kind of still lives and things like that. It wasn't really what I wanted to do. You know, I used to be very, very angry, you know, and I would, I would have this wild temper, you know. Um, but everyone's capable of doing bad things, you know. I'm interested in the human psyche because I'm... I feel as if I've gone to the the inner depths of myself, and and I hate it. You know, I really hate what I, what I found there. You know, I remember taking a drugs overdose once, and I kind of saw the gates of hell, literally. And it's not a good place to be. You know, it's the worst place possible. So I I managed to pull myself back. You know, uh, and survived that. I could have died that night, um, but I didn't. Um, so I mean, you, you come back scarred, obviously, after that, but I mean, Lorraine always says to me that um, 
I shouldn't really be here because the amount of abuse that I put my body through and my mind through. But I mean, she's she's seen it all. Um, not an easy person to be with, you know. And I think I'm a bit better now, but well, so not perfect, but I'm getting there. You're always walking on a tightrope, and you're. And I always say I walk on the edge of the cliff, you know, and the, the, the trick is not to fall off, you know, but you can go to the edge and look over into the abyss. And the abyss is frightening, but um, if, you can go, if you can go on the edge and look in, you know, and see, uh, see that, then you, you come back. It's a bit like Dante. Um, Dante was able to go to hell and come back, but people used to say he was always more burnt looking when he came back, you know. And when he turned up one day at a monastery, uh, the monks opened the door and they, they said, what do you want? And he said, I want peace. You know, that was what he said, you know, so it's, there is a part of me that wants that peace. It's, uh, it's, um, it's why I'm not really frightened of the death thing, you know, because it's it's the it's the uh, I, w I want peace, you know, and I think that I believe that this is just like a, a very very brutal training ground, and and it's like the real life is still to come, you know. There's hardly anyone believes that these days. There's not many people believe it. I don't care if I'm wrong, you know, at the end of the day, because I'll never know it anyway. Uh, I'll never know it if I'm, when I die, obviously, you know, if I die and wake up in heaven, then I'll be delighted. Uh, my daughter Lucy was born in 1986, and um, she had lots of problems. Um, Right from when she was born, she had a hole in the heart and a collapsed uh, lung and jaundice and an allergy to milk, um, milk products um, straight away. Um, she started losing weight quite, quite rapidly and then she ended up in an incubator for quite a long time. So she was ill, pretty seriously ill for about uh, six months, the first six months of her life. Um, and uh, miraculously, the the hole in the heart healed itself. Um, but after about probably about a year, when she was one, um, Terry and I realised that um, that she was different. She was about three and a half before she really really um, spoke properly, but it wasn't really the first words that she said weren't what we expected. It was to do with numbers and letters. So we, you know, we, we realized that after a while when she did start speaking that she was obsessed with numbers, the number plates on cars and things like that, and um, words as well. She loves words. I do these drawings for her, um, magic drawings I call them, and they're done in invisible ink and they, she uncovers them and there's all sorts of weird codes that I do and mathematical problems and uh, word, word meanings of words and she's interested in like geography and history and uh, she's interested in detectives like me and crime stories, so I do these stories for her and I invent these animals. Uh, she's a big Pokemon fan as well, so I do lots of stuff with Pokemon. Um, uh, she loves Pokemon, it's kind of, um, I mean, I've grown to love it myself as well because it's um, something about it. I don't know what it is that's, that's so appealing to her. School was terrible for her. 
think she was bullied again. You know, she I mean, she was bullied badly at school, um, and she had to go to a special school, a long, long, a long way away from where we were, and and that affected her very badly. I think as well. I think it was a mistake to send her there. Actually, um, uh, I think that set her back. So that was a mistake. Um, she still talks about it, actually, she calls it hell. Um, she said, I, I was in hell then, you know, so it, it must have been bad. But she is quite an amazing person. I mean, she's 36 now, and um, she's more settled now probably than she's ever been. Um, she's, her carer is her brother, Guy, but she is, an amazing person. I mean, she's very interested in what I do art-wise, and she loves it. She's so much like me, I think, really, you know. This painting, uh, well, it's called, it's from the series The Blind Leading the Blind. Um, a mother and daughter. Um, I don't exactly know what this is about, in a way. <laughs> I know it's got Lucy in it, because Lucy's being carried by a pregnant woman um, who might or might not be Terry. I don't know. It wasn't meant to be Terry, but someone maybe... I don't know. It wasn't meant to be a, a representation of Terry, my ex-wife, but... Um, it's got two other children in it, and I don't exactly know who they are either. It's a kind of strange, it's a kind of an, an enigma, really. Um, uh, so it's kind of like, to me, I mean, the series is called The Blind Leading the Blind, so maybe this is still The Blind Leading the Blind, because in some ways we're always like that. The woman is running to the beach to get away from something, to get away from the city. There's also a, a building with a sewage pipe trailing down. I seem to be very fond of, of that kind of image. Uh, to me, it, it describes our, our world. Um, and the beach is possibly a, a safety thing. It's you know, where I had all my religious experiences in the past was standing on a beach. That's where I get everything from, really, in that the sea coming in, so it, it's it, to me that's a kind of sanctuary. Um, there's a stormy sky in it. I mean, there's always a stormy sky in, in my paintings anyway, or a night sky. I don't very often do do happy sunny skies. I don't think I've ever painted the sun ever really properly. It's always got to be artificial light or a storm or lightning or a moon or a fireball, or a comet, or an asteroid, or something like that, but it's always apocalyptic. Um, and it's a kind of monumental painting. I had. This series was very successful. Um, uh, you know, I think people liked the paintings a lot. Um, and I liked the series myself. Um, I was very pleased, pleased the way it turned out. Um, I always just realised there's another baby that she's got a baby on her back as well. So there's actually four children in it, and, or three children and a baby. Um, I think even the wee the wee boy in it at the at the forefront uh, the, that's leading the the charge is um, got a baseball cap on. I think uh, I'm slightly obsessed by baseball caps as well. Um, and obsessed with the uh, the fact that this wee boy might be a bit of a wee tear away or not, I don't know. I was going to talk about autism because I wasn't um, diagnosed till about 1994, I think it was. Um, uh, it was actually a, an old um, 
It was actually a, a Jewish doctor, a kind of almost like a. I think he was quite ultra orthodox guy, but anyway, he was a great person, and I went to see him for another ailment in London. Sent to him actually, and he diagnosed me on the spot. Um, so that's how I got my first diagnosis. Obviously, it wasn't direct as that. It, I needed to go for for a, an assessment and everything, but I did get diagnosed um, uh, properly then. Um, that made me understand things a lot more. Uh, I've always thought of me being autistic um, uh, as being good and bad. You know, it's got some terrible things about it, but it's also got some very beautiful things about it. It's enabled me to to see things in a different way from a lot of other people, and to think laterally a lot, um, and to to um, well, that's the good part of it. I mean, it's <laughs> maybe there's not so many good bits, but the, the the art thing is definitely one, you know. But, but and also the joy of the joy of words, and I think it's also affected my spirituality as well because it's it's made me more believing as a person and uh, sim simple and kind of like uh, I I don't try and I don't try and dissect too much into belief, you know. I just believe, you know, and that's it. But um, in a kind of uh, almost a naive way, you know, which I prefer actually. I quite like naive. Um, the bad parts of it are obvious that um, it can cause a great harm um, as well with the, especially my um, impulsiveness or my um, destructiveness. I mean, I have been very destructive. Um, that's part of um, part of it with the drink, drugs, stuff uh, to do with. Uh, uh, relationships or um, bad relationships, gangsters, uh, bad bad people, um, you know, uh, greed, um, me wanting to to really go to the edge of the abyss. Um, a hedonistic lifestyle which I wanted to experience, you know, just for the, the sake of experiencing the idea of being able to... I mean, I suddenly just start, started making huge amounts of money and I thought, you know, like, I don't particularly want to save up money, I just want to just kind of like use it. So I started buying tickets on Concorde at one point and flying all over the place um, on Concorde. Uh, and having this kind of hedonistic lifestyle and mixing with the stars, you know, like mixing with David Bowie or Madonna and people like that, you know, and I was staying in Hollywood houses, homes, you know, like were mansions and kind of, uh, you know, experiencing stuff that I would never thought I would ever experience, but I knew. I knew in a way it was eating away at my soul as well. It wasn't, you know, some of it was good, but I knew that it was bad for me, you know, so, but I still wanted to experience it. So, you know, to, I've used that in my art as well. Um, and I don't regret it, even though I've said sorry for it a lot when I pray, you know, because I did things that I shouldn't have done. Again, I can't totally, I feel embarrassed about blaming autism totally on my behaviour, but that is a big part of me, um, a big part of this naiveness of wanting to the excitement of, of uh, the excitement of doing something that's a bit naughty, for instance, you know. So it can get, you know, it it makes me understand people as well, you know, the way that people are, you know. Um, as an artist, I wanted to to just eat everything that I could see, you know, or everything that I could feel, you know. And um, 
I put it down on paper and I put it down into my work. Um, and goods come of it a lot of the time, you know. Is I think I've 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 managed to to kind of sanctify things a wee bit, you know, in a way that um, to do with uh, relationships, for instance. I've, I've 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 learnt so much about myself, but I've also learnt years ago when I had this amazing religious experience when I was pretty near to to not being here when I was in a hospital and I was in this kind of cell really and I thought this is me I've had it really you know and a voice came out of nowhere and just said you know you it comforted me you know so this was the religious it was a light appeared from nowhere in this small dark room and I had this amazing experience of letting go and handing it over you know really I stopped drinking I stopped drug taking um, I had this whole year of the, the voice said to me I'm going to give you like a year of me being with you the whole time and you'll be comforted and you'll be you'll be you'll feel serene you know and I did that's exactly what happened it left me after a year and and that was quite difficult, but I but but then I'd got on to this new new journey that I was on, so I was able to handle things in a different way now. So that was when I started to get better, and I started to get over the the effects of the of Bosnia, for instance. When I went to Bosnia, I had this terrible, you know, it was like being in the worst nightmare you could ever imagine for me for being someone that's that hates noise or hates hates arguments, stress, conflict, and to be in the middle of a conflict is is a very frightening thing, you know. So it, it's it's um, when I came back, I was mentally disturbed. I mean, I was so mentally disturbed that I left my family home. I left everyone. I left Lucy, my daughter. I left my wife. I left everyone and moved away. And I had this crazy year of, um, of uh, well, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't even remember a lot of it, but I did manage to do this crazy amount of work in about a year. I managed to do like 300 paintings and drawings in a year, and they formed the basis of my Bosnian work. So. That was the good part of it. The bad part was I, I scarred myself really, and I, I, I I'm, you know, it was a tunnel that I, I almost didn't get through. But I did see the light. I always kind of, you know, in a way, I, I trust in God to get me through it, and I, and I did get through it. You know, and it wasn't me that got me through it. I don't ever, I don't believe that you can ever do it on your own. It's a bit like uh, being a member of the um, AA, you know, it's like uh, you need that kind of higher power. So, um, alcohol and uh, drugs were part of my life and part of my autism, but alcohol and drugs and anything that distracts you away from the great life force of the universe, the dance of the universe is going to destroy your art and that's what was happening to me so I realized that I had to do that to save it's like being it's like being disconnected from from the uh, from the dance of the universe really and you don't want to be disconnected because it means death so I, I've managed to I don't drink or take drugs now so that given me so much coming through now. There's this fallacy really in art and performing arts and anything to do with art that it's a bohemianism and to do with drink drugs or whatever that it somehow enhances your art. That's not true. I don't believe it's true.
I'm kind of like addicted in a way to religion. I've always been religious. I like to move people uh, and to, in a way, to bring the Bible into this world we live in today and the events that happened so long ago and the whole belief thing. And people are very frightened. I mean, there's two camps really of people. There's the people that groan whenever they see a religious painting of mine and they say, oh, why can't he stay away from religion? There's that kind of embarrassment about religion. Uh, they don't like my religious art, but I continue to do it. It's not very popular with um, a lot of people. And then there's the other people that are actually are religious, but don't like it because it's too frightening for their gentle, uh, staid kind of normal religiousness um, who don't want anything nasty happening in their lives or anything that's going to be cause a stir. So they they... You know, to me, to them, it's a big danger as well. The stuff they do because it's, it's kind of, it's you know, it's violent, it's real, it's like the consuming fire of God. It's, it's, um, you know, it's the Bible is a, is an incredible book. It's, um, it's a book that's got everything in it really. It's got so much, uh, so much. Uh, Tragedy, violence, um, uh, disaster, despair. And it's also got incredible revelation in it, incredible acts of love and kindness as well. So it's got everything in it, really. And I think people, people, uh, people misunderstand a lot of it. You know, they, they um, tend to dwell on the bad bits. But, uh, and I can't really answer a lot of the questions. I'm not really an expert. All I know is that, um, all I know is that my own work and the work I do on the Bible and on the teachings of Jesus or the events in Jesus' life, which have in fact fascinated artists for centuries. I don't know why it shouldn't continue with me, you know, and it's, 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 it, it's for me to paint these things, it, it, um, it's made a big difference to a lot of people's lives. So it helps people. It's, it is a therapy again, you know, it's a therapy, but it also takes them, it takes them through a door into a different universe altogether. It takes them into a new world, a new discovery where they realize that they're not just a person that's just flesh and blood and an animal. It means that there's a spiritual side that they've missed out on. And that's the most important thing that they could ever understand or realize. And it's a kind of, it's a, it's salvation really for them, for people to go through that, that door. And that's the door I want to lead them through. Um, so, I mean, when I paint subjects from the Bible, it's, um, I go through it, it's almost like praying, you know, and whenever I draw it's like praying anyway. I get kind of quite ecstatic really doing it. Um, when I paint Jesus, for instance, I mean, there's so many different facial expressions that you can get, and there's so many different. You could paint an infinity, millions and trillions of of pictures of Jesus, and not, not, you know, they want they'll all be different. You know, every single one will be different. To me, you know, it's it's really an amazing feeling to do it. I mean, I don't care what people think of them, really, um, as long as they move some people or I get a reaction off them, you know. I get lots of uh, messages from people that are violently opposed to them as well. 
and that doesn't bother me. It makes me feel that that um, they're kind of angry for some reason, and they, you know, they've had a tragedy in their life, and you know, everyone has tragedy in their life um, to a certain extent. Some people more than others. Um, I think I always remember what C.S. Lewis said that if you can, if you have this feeling of almost despair and you can't go on, then the thing to do is to go on. When I do religious stuff, it's kind of, it, it is theatrical, um, which I think is a good thing actually, theatricality, you know, to, because it, it, it um, it's exciting, it's kind of like being on a, like the characters are on a stage and they're performing and, you know, the theatre of life and everything, you know, so it's, it's the colours I use and the compositions are, are theatrical. Um, is, I love movement. There's a, there's a particular painting of uh, the Backstreet Crucifixion. It's St. Andrew, actually. And there's a kind of swirling movement to this, which is, it is very dramatic. It's like a film, almost. Again, it's very filmic, my work. Um, I love to capture movement. It's actually not an easy thing to get movement, you know, to try and capture it because, you know, you're creating movement on a, a flat two-dimensional surface, you know, and it's like, it's, it's hard to do. Uh, it's taken me a long, long time to, to even understand how to do it. I remember going back about, 40 odd years ago, I struggled, you know, like I struggled to get to paint really, you know, because it, painting is a learning process that can take years and years and years and years. You know, you're always kind of learning techniques and how to compose a painting, but movement is a very, is a very elusive thing. You have to try and try, and it, it's a difficult, you can't even describe, I can't even describe how, it, how it's done really. Drawing is like the, drawing to music is like the quartets or the um, sonatas or the, you know, the, the, the quintets or whatever. It's, to, it's, the, it's the preparation for the symphonies, which is the, the big oils. But um, to get an expression on a face that really, that really is, is you know, it captures uh, the, the audience, or it, you know, it, it moves people, is to is uh, is something that I can't explain. I'm afraid, so I'm sorry. I can't explain that. It's just a, it just happens. Um, so it, it, it's, you know, to me, it's a religious thing again. You know, people are probably groan when they hear me saying that, but it's something that doesn't come out of. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I am a, it's a bit unusual for a Christian to say they're a humanist, but I am a humanist and I love people and I love, I do love the, the goodness of people, you know, because people are good, you know, there's not one person on the, on the whole that's ever been that's totally and utterly bad. I was in the army in 1977. Um, I was in there for in the army for less than a year. It was a nightmare. I don't think there was any point in the whole time I was there that I enjoyed. But one of the punishments in the army was a regimental bath, where someone that was considered unhygienic or dirty or smelly was submerged in a bath full of really horrible things. It was kind of wrong in a way because it was, in actual fact, it was bullies, 
you know, people that, soldiers that did it to other soldiers simply because they were, they were outsiders or they weren't considered part of the, part of the, the, the uh, inner circle of who, who ran. You know, there's always these people that take control of things and there was a, a kind of inner elite in the, in who the, the tough guys, if you know what I mean. So they, they picked on the weaker people. I must admit, I was never bullied in the army, which was incredibly surprising for me that I wasn't, because I was very quiet, you know, but it, um, I think that was probably because I knocked someone out in the first week of um, when we did boxing, um, and that kind of quieted everyone up, but they, they picked on someone one day who started crying halfway up a cliff when they got stuck. And they were, this person was punished by by having a was by by being given a, a regimental birth. So um, yeah, it's a particularly painful uh, memory for me because it it colours it coloured my view of humanity, um, and I suddenly realised that we have a de demon inside of us all, really. Um, you know, I witnessed this as well, and. I didn't do anything about it, so in a way it was a cowardly thing to watch this happening and not do anything about it. So I realised my own inner demons as well. So I was commissioned to go um, uh, in the 19... 93, I think it was, yeah, something like that. So uh, it's a, an official position from the Imperial War Museum. It's the, had a long history of war artists. People always think it's a bit weird having a war artist in a modern war because of photography and everything like that, but I think it's incredibly important to have it, you know, and I was... I was um, Anyway, the time the, the London Times sponsored it. They paid for the kind of commission, um, and I didn't think about it really properly until I actually got there. And then suddenly I realised I was in the middle of a war zone. And um, you know, the first thing is I had a bit of a nightmare trip actually. Again, I always do, um, but um, I hate travelling that much. I mean, I hated travelling at that point. Uh, I felt a bit out, out, sort of an outsider, really, because you've got the soldiers there, and the soldiers don't, aren't interested in hanging out with an artist, really. Um, I remember the. I remember hearing in the hills. I remember how, uh, the first day there. I heard this rumbling in the hills, and I thought it was thunder. And I said to the said to one of the officers, I, is, that a, is that a thunderstorm that I can hear? He said, no, that's, that's the theatre of war. You know, that's, the, that's gunfire and explosions and all that. So it suddenly hit me and then, and then they put a flak jacket on me and a helmet. And, a, and then I, you know, I did my, did my stuff, I suppose, you know, seeing death and destruction and just the kind of banality of war and the, the terrible suffering of people. Um, the feeling of death and the smell of death and uh, the, the whole, um, you know, you see absolute evil. And it's partly humans, but there's a sense that it's not just humans, that there is a palpable sense of evil in the air and it affects it infects humans really it's not you know they we have the demon in us but it, there's also an outside force coming in so it but having said that you do get good as well there and you get great heroism and you get great courage a lot of people had this tremendous sense of of um of love there as well, so there's all these a mixture of things. From um, I saw there's one particular. We visited a lot of villages that were 
predominantly Muslim villages and um, some of these villages were up in the mountains and they didn't even know why they, why they were being shelled and because they didn't even know there was a war on but they, all they knew was there was bombs coming towards them. Uh, you know, we, we went to see these people and it was quite... Uh, there was other villages that we went to see where, again, it was a lot of Muslim villages uh, who were being shelled by two different enemies as well. So it was um, a, and they, 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 these villages had their own fighters as well, who were very quite frightening people actually. Um, I remember a few times I, I was kind of quite scared. In fact, uh, there was a time when I was in a town um, when uh, the vehicle we were in was hit four times and um, and there was quite a few... I mean, I had to duck a few times, you know, it was kind of crazy. But And I felt very... I felt... At one point, I felt this terrible fear of... Um, of not dying, but the actual act of dying, you know, what would happen if a bullet struck you, you know, and how you would feel. So I had all these nightmares going on in my head. And I think for someone like me, with a very vivid imagination, it made it even more terrifying. But the way I drew, or I, I didn't do much drawing on the spot, but I saw this woman, um, you know, who, I decided to draw her, and um, I don't know if she knew that I was drawing her, but anyway, I did, I did it anyway. And, uh, a lot of people don't like my representation of women, and um, but I, I just draw women the same way as I draw men, um, just humans, you know, so it's we're all the same, you know. We've got differences, I know, but... Um, uh, so I, 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 I don't know, it's the, everyone's got this, everyone's different really, and I like to draw as many different faces as I can. And uh, the people in Bosnia, I mean, I, there's a painting I did called um, uh, The Barrier Sunset. To me, Bosnia was all about barriers, it was all about checkpoints, every sort of ten 10 miles, you had to stop at a checkpoint. Some of them are very frightening, uh, very heavily armed militia. The thing about Bosnia was you never knew who who these people were, what side they were on. And I was lucky because I had a lot of soldiers with me and bodyguards, but that didn't make it any easier for me, I don't think, um, especially when I saw some of the bodyguards getting scared. It was an incredible experience and one that I I kind of immersed myself. I was being filmed all the time, which didn't help, actually. It made me quite self-conscious about showing my emotions. Um, and I got very ill the first time I was in Bosnia. I was I got dysentery and I was in a, a hospital in Bosnia for two days and and then they flew me home. But when I got back, the, everyone in the press and the people and the friends or whatever, so-called friends, thought that this was a very cowardly thing to do, you know, to come back early. So I kind of struggled, you know, I, I really felt terrible. Uh, my daughter was getting more and more bullied at school. My family were getting harassed. Everyone in the press were against me. Everyone was against me. Uh, I was getting a few people supporting me, but hardly any. Uh, so what I did was I had this kind of block, art block. I couldn't paint, I couldn't draw. And um, so what did I do, you know? Like I went back, which is crazy, but I wanted to go back. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I think everyone warned me that if I went back, it would destroy me, you know, but I had to go back. So it was this thing that about C.S. Lewis saying, you've always got to go on and keep on going. So I went on, I went back. 
And it was a great decision to make for me personally because it kind of exercised all the demons I had at the time. And it made me it made me not have that fear thing anymore when I went back. I lost my I was still, you know, scared, but it wasn't the same kind of dreaded fear of dying, you know. The dreaded fear of how you would die. So um you know, when I went back, it kind of saved me in a way, and I was able to do... The first time in Bosnia, I hardly did any work when I was over there, but the second time I went, I was able to do hundreds of pieces of work, and I was just working all the time, you know. All my art materials were stolen the second trip. Every single thing I had on me. Uh, so I had to beg for some paper. I didn't. They, no one had any paints or anything like that, so I used boot polish and candle wax to, to draw, to draw with, and I kind of invented this new technique that, that I used as well, which was to draw with candle wax and then rub through it with um, boot polish, because that's all I had, but the, create these amazing kind of dark images of people, you know, and events, so it, it really was amazing to do that. So it kind of in a way, I was glad my stuff was stolen because I was able to, to, to put the work down or the events and faces with immediacy, you know. So it was kind of amazing experience. But when I came back, it destroyed everything. Everything was destroyed. My whole family life, everything, you know. It was just, uh, I think I took a, uh, I just went insane, you know. I was able to have a maybe one peaceful year, I think, in the late 90s, you know, around about 96, 97 maybe, but after that it was just a, a haze of drink and drugs. Um, and then I was, I could hardly get up a flight of stairs by 1999. And, um, I kind of like went into a went into this spiral, and then I ended up in hospital in a clinic for the um, for the kind of alcoholically insane at the time, you know. So I was I was away with it, you know. And then that was a different period of my life altogether, because that's when I had the religious experience, and I came out. There's been several of these things happened throughout my life where I've been on the floor in the gutter and I've picked myself up or God's picked me up. Art is free, art's freedom. You can do anything you want in art. Um, it is freedom. I mean, it's such a... I mean, it, it can be good art and it can be bad art. You know, I can actually tell the difference between good art and bad art. Uh, sometimes... Sometimes I'll, I'll see something and I'll know that it's absolutely hit the mark, you know, and it's normally dark, <laughs> I have to say. It's not something that's that's totally kind of happy, but um, I mean, when you think of all the, when you think of all the uh, images that people get on the internet, for instance, it's like they can go into the darkest, most devious, most uh, evil, evil um, places uh, that you can imagine which is very harmful. But art is different. True art, that is, you know. Uh, so it's... Um, so I would encourage any any uh, young person or, you know, no matter what age you are or what stage you're at, is um, paint what you... paint what you see and paint what you imagine 
you know, and, and study and, uh, and really try and it's the imagination really you can you have to observe obviously it's a it's a technical thing you've got to you've got to be able to draw but drawing can be learned you can learn how to draw no one can ever ever teach you how to paint you have to learn that for yourself you have to kind of use your inner third eye whatever you call it to do that but um Drawing is something that can, you can practice that, draw all the time. Um, people are really pretty much the same. They always um, pour the baby out of the bathwater. So if something bad happens, like uh, it means everything's got to be completely turned over, you know. And it's, uh, it's kind of sad when you consider that at a press of a button, you can get anything you want on the internet, you know. So it's, whereas art is... You know, it's um, it, it's uh, people are frightened of expressing themselves. Or children's drawings are amazing because they see things in us so clearly, you know, and and they're so interesting, you know. They're they're much more interesting than some of the kind of stuff you see on people's walls, you know. When you go to people's houses and they've got the same old stuff on, it's always just trash, you know. It's, um, I'd much rather see a, like it's just, it's amazing. I love children's drawings, you know, and I love, um, I love looking, I love talking to them about it as well, and I love, um, it's a bit like prisoners, they send me a lot of the drawings, you know, and uh, their drawings are brilliant too, they're quite childlike as well, you know, it's like they think that, that you know, people are telling them that they're useless at everything, but they've got this inner thing where they can, express themselves through their art and that's the interesting thing about it that's the save that's that, that saves them you know i mean well it's not it doesn't save them completely but it's on the way to being to being you know to gaining some kind of forgiveness and redemption in their lives you know i mean in the past i've got too close to certain prisoners and ex-prisoners you know you know like they kind of the bad side of them trap you. If more people did art instead of instead of the destructive things, you know, we'd be we'd actually find out who we who we really are. You know, like we'd find the joy in life again. You know, the the joy I see every every day when I leave the the flat and walk Buster the dog, and I notice the birds and I notice the trees and the buildings, the beauty of the buildings. Even the beauty of a dirty old carrier bag floating along a gutter, you know, and it's just everything. There's nothing, there's nothing physically physical that's bad. Everything can be painted, and but it's this, you know, if, it, if people realise that the, the world is beautiful, you know, it is absolutely beautiful. The, the bad, the only bad thing is spirituality in the way that it can be turned into evil, you know what I mean? It's not ugliness, the ugliness of a person, for instance. There's no such thing as ugliness. It's all beauty. You know, a person's wrinkled old face, an old lady, an old man. These faces are beautiful to me. And the face of... It, it's what it, What is depressing is spiritual ugliness. You know, the evil in people, you know, or the, or the evil that people do. Again, that doesn't mean to say that they, they're going to roast forever in the fires of hell. I don't believe in any of that. You see, I believe in, I mean, this is when I start to get serious, but I don't believe that anyone, God sends people to hell. When they die, I believe that people choose their own hell, and hell for them is living, you know. It's the, they make hell for themselves. So... Anyway, I'm, I'm starting to sermonize almost, but that's the way I feel. In a way, that painting job, it means a lot to me because I I painted that with, obviously, I felt like job at the time when I painted it because I was very badly ill. I could hard, hardly hold a paintbrush at the time. I'd just, I'd just come out of hospital and I painted this and I, I was like that. I was shaking uh, because I was on so many drugs. 
I was on prescription drugs as I couldn't get off them, in fact. But um, and all the people pointing at them, it reminded me of what people were saying to me: oh, "It's your own fault. It's your own fault. You know, you do this, and if you don't do that, blah blah blah." Everyone had their own opinion about it, about why I was ill and the way I was why I was acting, the way I was doing. But um, so, it, you know, this painting job, it it means a lot to me because. You know, it's probably a, I don't know whether Job was a real person or not, you know, or whether he was historically a person, you know, that suffered these terrible afflictions, which um, it's, a, it's a fantastic story anyway from the Bible. But it gives me a lot of strength thinking about Job, you know, because this man had every single affliction you could imagine under the sun. He lost his family, he lost his sons and daughters he lost his all the money he, he had he got all the diseases under the sun he, he sat in a dung heap and then people came up to him and made it even worse by advising him where he went wrong so this man never lost his faith he kept on going and he won through in the end so it means a lot to me that story When the COVID pandemic struck, um, it was kind of weird because it, in a way it saved me because I was getting ill again, I remember. I remember I was just about to go. I was having these kind of psychotic things going on in my head and then suddenly this thing happened and it meant I had to stay, stay put and just kind of walk the dog and every now and then and get, you know, it kind of made me a bit like, I felt a bit like St. Francis in a cave, you know, like um, it was like I had this kind of healing thing going on again. And then I picked up these big sheets of paper and I started to draw with felt pen and ink and pencil and crayon and gouache and all this stuff. And I created this massive series of coronavirus um, drawings, which... Um, you know, they've got so many different levels on them and there are lots of different people um, in them. There's masses, crowds of people. It's all based on the, the, the whole psychological effect of coronavirus on us. And uh, uh, it's just really exciting to do these drawings from such a terrible tragedy, obviously. Um, you know, there's nothing to say you shouldn't use a tragedy to create work that is that means something for people, to show the fear in the faces of people. Um, and then the war in Ukraine started, and I started doing a mixture of the coronavirus drawings and the war. Basically, not just Ukraine, but the whole feeling of of what's happening in the world today, how the world is a lot more dangerous now than it's ever been before, I think. Simply because we've all been brought together uh, by this kind of globalization of communications, which everyone thought that was going to bring the world together in a good way, but it's actually divided the world in a more dangerous way. Um, which again shows human nature. Um, we are the most destructive uh, people. We are very destructive. Um, we don't seem to learn, you know. People think that, modern people think that we've kind of progressed, you know, since the ancient times, you know, we've kind of become more humane, but that's rubbish, absolute rubbish. We haven't, we've become more brutal. Um, sounds a bit depressing, doesn't it? But um, I think that uh, as soon as we understand that there's going to be no utopia, utopia is a pipe dream, you know, no one, we will never progress towards that. That doesn't mean to say we won't still go on, you know, but um, it means that we're closer to, to this self-destruct button. 
Having said that, I mean, there's so many good people, and I still love people in general, you know. So we had, we still we still do have this amazing, you know, like war and disease and the Black Death and everything. According to C.S. Lewis, again, my mentor was that that's God's megaphone to us. It, it's a way of of making us realise that there is something beyond. So that's the way I'd like to end it. There is something beyond this. In a way, it's a bit like Plato, when Plato says we're living in a dungeon, but outside the sun is shining, you know. But we refuse to leave the dungeon.